Hello people of the internet and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're new. Today we're going to be talking about the mysterious disappearance of Phoenix Colden. On May 25th, 1988, Goldia Reeves gives birth to a beautiful baby girl named Phoenix Lucille Colden. While her daughter was still young, Goldia meets a man named Lawrence Colden, who, as you can tell by his last name, um, she ends up marrying and becoming Phoenix's father figure. After they marry and he adopts Phoenix, the family picks up and moves to Spanish Lake, Missouri because he gets a job. And Spanish Lake, Missouri is where she would grow up. Goldia and Lawrence were deeply religious and were described as strict parents. From this detail alone, you could probably guess what kind of childhood uh, Phoenix had. She was brought up to be very religious and have religious beliefs. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, I can't remember, but it's either the fifth or sixth grade. From one of those grades, she was homeschooled onwards. So to say the least, Phoenix grew up very sheltered. Despite being homeschooled, because homeschooled kids have all these stereotypes on them, despite that, she excelled in pretty much everything. Academics, music, sports. She learned how to play several instruments, including the violin, guitar, and piano. She even went on to become a local fencing champion in St. Louis County. All around, Phoenix was a very sweet, hardworking, polite girl who grew up to be a very talented young adult. In 2007, Phoenix started her studies at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. It was at this point when she hit 18, her parents decide to co-sign an apartment lease for her to live with her friend. So now we're going fast forward a bit to December 11th of 2011. She is a junior in college. It started out a normal Sunday but turned into anything but. After church, Goldia watches her daughter leave the house and get in her car. And this wasn't odd because a lot of the times Phoenix would not feel like her bedroom was private enough for phone calls. So she would exit the house and most of the time take her calls in the car just because she just felt like it was more private. So when her mother sees her leave and just sit in the car for a second, she doesn't get alarmed by this. It's not a weird behavior. Around 2.20 PM, Lawrence, sees Phoenix leaving in Goldia's car. And she didn't tell her parents she was leaving, even though short notice plans aren't her thing. He assumed that she was going to the grocery store to get snacks or maybe stop by a friend's house. But little did he know this would be the last time he would see Phoenix. Goldia said, Phoenix never left the house without saying something, without saying, I'm going down the street or I'm going to the store. Phoenix never left the house like that. Although Goldia and Lawrence didn't know that their daughter was missing, the 1998 black Chevy was found abandoned in a dangerous section of East St. Louis. To be more specific, it was found on the corner of 9th Street and St. Clair Ave at 5.27 p.m. And remember guys, she left around 2.20, so this is only a couple of hours later. Where her car was found was only 25 minutes away from her parents' home. From there, the car was impounded as abandoned by the police at 6.23 p.m. and its registered owner, who is Goldia, was not notified. So what did the police do? What they do best, nothing. They didn't run the plates to see who the vehicle belonged to. They didn't even search the area where they found the vehicle. Goldie and Lawrence literally didn't find out until a family friend told them. On January 1st, 2012, a family friend had called them saying that they saw their car at the impound lot. And when they found out where the car was found in the first place, they really couldn't figure out what business their daughter had going over there. We would have had a two week head start if we'd known where the car was, Lawrence told reporters. When the Coldens went to go finally retrieve the car, East St. Louis police told them that they did not take inventory because they didn't find any personal items in the car, which was not true. So not only did they not do anything, they lied. That was not true, said Goldia Colden. When we checked the vehicle at the impound lot, there was a lot of things in it, including her glasses, her purse, with her driver's license, and her shoes. Goldia also had to complain to the mayor's office to avoid paying the impound bill, which totaled to be over a thousand dollars. This sadly wouldn't be the only time that the Coldens would face financial hardships and bureaucratic difficulties pertaining to their daughter's disappearance. According to the police, Phoenix was a runaway. Neither them nor the media gave this case the time of day. They didn't treat this case with any, any type of urgency, but I bet you if she was blonde, blue eyes and pretty, they would have been on it. The lack of interest with cases involving missing black women 
women is tragic and it happens way more often than you think. At the end of the day, the police didn't do enough to help this family find their daughter. To attract more media attention, her parents contacted Black and Missing Foundation and they also hired a private investigator named Steve Foster. When Phoenix went to school, she lived a different life, one completely hidden from her parents. She lived a double life because she knew her parents wouldn't approve. She told her parents that she was living with a female friend, but in reality, it was her boyfriend, Michael B. But this wasn't the only secret that came out when she vanished. Although she was a junior at University of Missouri-St. Louis, she hadn't enrolled in any classes happening that semester. At some point, her friends claim that she started listening to rap music and trying out drugs at that point in her life. Now there's nothing wrong with listening to rap music, but this was very out of character for her. She was even arguing with her parents more and it was just like a total switch up in her personality. She was just very irritable down and paranoid in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. Her mental health was just unstable. Phoenix was convinced that some people were out there watching her and somebody was out to get her. Phoenix and her friend Akira argued and Akira said, we argued about something stupid. She said, I had said something about her and her boyfriend. I don't know if it was just her trying to scare me, but she carried around a knife. She pulled it out and I was like, okay, Okay, well, are you going to use it? Who are you cutting? This knife was never found. Later, she would tell a friend that she was packing up and leaving by herself. And this friend says that the Phoenix in front of her was unrecognizable. Eventually it was discovered that Phoenix was using two cell phones, one under the family paid plan and one that she was paying herself. She used phone number two to talk to another man. Man number two is also named Mike. Investigators interviewed Mike's ex-girlfriend who claimed that he could get violent sometimes and he would get violent with her. She even had to go as far as filing a restraining order against him because that's how bad it got. She admitted to the police that she had heard about the disappearance and had her suspicions, but she had no idea whether he was involved or not. When she asked Mike if he had been involved, Mike's response was, why are you worrying about someone who's dead? Meanwhile, the family is combing East St. Louis for any signs of life. Goldia even spent time interviewing local prostitutes and drug dealers in hopes of finding her daughter. Foster the PI also ends up finding out that she had two birth certificates, one reading her mother's maiden name, Reeves. This made investigators look into the possibility that maybe she went off and started a new life somewhere. Maybe somewhere she's out there living life as Phoenix Reeves, but there was no evidence of this. However, they did uncover that there is a record of a Phoenix Reeves in Anchorage, Alaska, who has no birth certificate or no SOCH. But when they went to investigate, no one had ever heard of her. One month before she disappeared, Phoenix had posted a video. And if you're familiar with the case, you probably know what I'm talking about. In it, she states how she wants to start over, but she can't start the new me over. And then she also recites the serenity prayer and asks God to help her accept the things that won't change before stating, I don't remember when I was happy, genuinely happy. I feel so stupid because I let myself go back a bit. I probably would have been in a better situation if I would have stuck with how it used to be. What the Colden family and Phoenix's friends struggled to accept is how could she want to leave everybody and everything she loves? So what happened to Phoenix Colden? Well, we have three theories. Theory number one is human trafficking. Contrary to popular belief, most sex trafficking incidents don't happen because a guy in a white van snatches you off the street. Although possible, it's not how it happens most of the time. It usually will happen as a gradual recruit over time. While recruiting methods may vary, trafficking victims can be convinced by their partners under seemingly innocent circumstances. St. Louis is also in the top 20 places for human trafficking in America, which I did not know before this case. I-70, a popular highway that connects um, Missouri to Kansas City, is also known as the sex trafficking highway. Of America. In 2014, Kelly Fraunhart, an old friend of Phoenix's, claims that she saw her get on her flight leaving Las Vegas. The woman even reacted apparently when she called Phoenix's name. She had been traveling with several young women and two men who looked like they could be professional football players and because of this she did not approach them or engage at all. 
Theory number two is that she ran away. Maybe she really did run away to start a new life. Police have apparently found evidence that shows that she willingly left and implied that Phoenix's friends possibly were in on it and knew something. Phoenix made it seem like she wanted to really walk away from her life. Her video made that super clear. And I feel that a lot of us have had those feelings at one point in our lives where we just want to say it and walk away, but few of us actually do it. We don't know what she was possibly dealing with or gotten herself into or the real reasons why she was so desperate to want to start over. So this theory still isn't definite and Phoenix's parents don't see any reason for her to want to run away. The third and final theory is a foul play. Phoenix went missing and was never heard from again. Not one peep, not activity on any social media accounts or bank activity or phone calls, nothing. Zip. Nada. This suggests that possibly her life ended. I do want to know, I read somewhere um, that her parents apparently got a phone call from somebody claiming to be their daughter, but this of course was not, this wasn't anything. People are cruel. But they do believe that their daughter got involved with a sketchy group who is not coming forward and saying anything. In 2012, the police admitted that they were concerned about her safety, but also admitted that there was no one else's DNA found in her car other than her own. There was no evidence of foul play at all. But you have to also think about it. Like, they didn't even search the area in the amount of time that they should have. So, just saying. There's also evidence that suggests that Phoenix could have possibly been dealing with multiple men prior to her disappearance. People were very suspicious of Michael B because according to their phone records, he had had several conversations with her on the phone that day. Long conversations at that. While being questioned by the police, he claims that he has no idea what they were talking about, even though, again, I wanna emphasize, they were long conversations. You would think you would remember a little bit. Akira apparently stated that Phoenix didn't know how to break up with Michael B and began dating cell phone Mike. Both of these men have motive. However, police defended Michael B saying he was so cooperative with them and so they ruled him out. And cell phone Mike was also cleared of any wrongdoings. Goldia and Lawrence have spent their life savings trying to find their daughter. At one point, a Texas man claimed to know where Phoenix was. The family then spent everything. They spent it all on private investigators following this one tip. Only for this pathetic loser, pathetic piece of excuse me, this is horrible. Like, how could you do this to this poor family? All to find out that he made it all up. The family is literally walking on a prayer to carry them through their days. And I'm not religious. And I pray too that they get their answers and their daughter is able to come home safely or at least some info to come forward that they know what happened or that they know she's safe. The case of Phoenix Colden is still open. It's not too late. If you do know any information, please contact the St. Louis Police Department. My heart goes out to the family. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any cases you want me to talk about, please leave them as a suggestion in the comments and I'll make sure to check them out. Don't forget to like, subscribe, all that other jazz. Namaste, have a nice day guys.